this is the moment where Arsenal found a way. I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about the league table. We've got to have a look at that, which sees Arsenal in top spot, but not just about second spot, which I'm sure is gently annoying you all. But we're going to talk about how Man City and Arsenal cancelled each other out somewhat. But overall, Mikel Arteta, with this little bit of genius, found a way. And I don't think people will focus on the goal enough. But there is some clear directives here from this team that I will go through. And it is spectacular in terms of just, yeah, as I say, that phrase, finding a way, which I think will be the theme throughout. Now, Arsenal, of course, have had to accumulate to a different level of expectation. You've had some big money signings come in, of course. But also, like so many teams in the league this year, so many injuries and difficulties there. And when it comes to the best eleven that you can put out... It made it very, very difficult. And go check out the preview because that's kind of what we were trying to get across with the preview is that there probably will be a lot of cancelling out here because you've got two teams that have got key players out. So these are the two lineups that we saw in this game. And the thing that we thought might happen kind of did happen because the bulk of the game was played in between the 18-yard box. And that led to the defence is being on top, if we're honest. The players that came in, let's focus on the ones that were sort of um, noteworthy. Jorginho came into the side, uh, which was interesting. Thomas Partey not starting, but of course comes on and we'll show you the goal and break it down in just a second. Trossard playing on the left-hand side for Arsenal. In Ketier, Gabriel Jesus, of course, importantly, coming in for Saka. But Martinelli was on the bench, of course, and made a huge difference. We'll talk about that in just a second. But... That's not the 11 that you want to put out, uh, you know. And I guess another talking point would be David Rea, which we, we need to discuss a little bit because I felt like it was a little bit over the top, some of the, the commentary personally. When it came to Man City, very different. You know, you had Rodri and De Bruyne, which, of course, you knew you were going to have out for a while. And it was Bernardo Silva who played in that six, had several, several, so many touches of the ball straight away getting on it. And I think what it provided was a lack of physicality, certainly in that midfield. But in what was such a congested area, what he was looking for, I think, Pep Guardiola was a bit more mobility and actually just to control the game. And that is what Man City did in the first half. I thought they made Arsenal feel a bit twitchy. They looked a bit lost. There was a lack of... There's a lack of cohesion in that Arsenal team, understandably so, because as I say, it was congested and narrow. You had Alvarez who would play out wide, sure, but was actually kind of coming into these spaces as well because he wants to help out Haaland at times. Foden doing similar stuff. Guardiola, who's not your out-and-out left-back, even though he can drive with the ball fantastically well. Even someone like Zinchenko was stepping in here so that Declan Rice could move a little bit more down this left channel. And so it just means that there's a lot of players, even someone like Trossard, who was holding his wit throughout the game, once he gets the ball, really, he wants to sort of drive inside. He's got no belief in the idea that he's going to be able to get round the side of him. And so that what that led to was just an inability for absolutely anyone to get in behind. And even someone like Gabriel Jesus, because there, there were a couple of moments where someone like Zinchenko would get on the ball. He would be able to play the ball to Jorginho. Let's see if we can move the ball here to Jorginho, and then that ball was being able to be made through and you beat in the press with Odegaard. And Gabriel Jesus, just because, you know, he's not Bukayo Saka, he was someone who kind of gently wanted the ball to feet, more so than getting in behind. And at half time, the notes that I took, the thing that was, I thought, killing Arsenal a little bit was that it was safe, wasn't it? It was all in front of this Man City defence that is very, very good when players are in front of you because they're going to win their aerial duels. But Gabriel Jesus wasn't doing enough of that for me. When there was one moment in particular, as I say, that pass from Zinchenko to Jorginho to Odegaard. And what you want is Jesus to start wide, but work from out to in. Because if he does that, Guardiol can't totally see him. And then he can make that driving run into there. Now, if Odegaard can't play that past him, so be it. But it allows Ben White to get on the ball, if not. And you can start and play these triangles a little bit higher at the pitch. And you can see that in the average positions as well. Such a focus down this right-hand side with, as you can see, Gabriel Jesus hugging that touchline. And when they were able to work the ball up the pitch, yep, okay, he was able to get on the ball. And that triangle 
of the three that you would normally see with Saka out there. It was there, but it was in a safe area for Man City. And overall, they were pretty competent. And the idea was to try and suck in the opposition a lot of the time. And that's where we got to talk about David Rea, who I thought, look, was a little bit cagey at times. But I think if you go through the different moments where he struggled, a couple of crosses, absolutely, look, you can't get away with not critiquing him for that. But in terms of being on the ball... I felt like there was one bad pass that he made and then there was a few bad passes to him where it is going to be that little bit tight. And there were moments where he had been given clear instruction to let the opposition sort of make their way to him and then he's got to play the ball through. And if you look at, say, the Declan Rice, the challenge on Kovacic, who, let's get that out of the way, should have gone, let's be honest. He should have definitely gone. I was amazed that he was able to sort of stick around for the game after that second one because the first one, I think I think um, the commentary was spot on with that. Gary Neville was right. He said that the first one was sort of orange, but the second one was, you know, a booking as well in its own right. But that comes from David Rea playing those passes. So that felt a little bit over the top. But what I would say is that that whole problem, look, I'm going to talk about Arteta and how amazing he has been here and how he has found a way. But he has also found a way to create a bit of a, a storm there when it comes to the goalkeeper position. And I think the drop-off from Ramsdale to David Rea mean, isn't enough for him to have created this problem. Now, I think he will get past it, David Rea, and you can see what he can do with some of his passing. But Ramsdale's a great player as well. And one question for the comments for Arsenal fans is, like, how do you feel about that whole scenario? Because I think it has become a story. We are talking about it. And for me, it's not one where, like, if you think David Rea is the better goalkeeper, fine. But for me, the sort of bleeding in of him into the team, I think, could have been a little bit different. And it's more of a case of when do you do it in, in, um, as opposed to if. And it felt like the when here hasn't been totally spot on. That said, of course, they won the game. And one of the reasons why I think they won the game and the defence was on top was because of the way that Man City played. And again, talking about that lack of width, I thought Doku would come on in the second half. Didn't have the impact that I thought he would have because Arsenal seemed to be in the ascendancy from that point of view. But you can see it from the average positions here that it was just very, very narrow. You know, Julian Alvarez and Foden. Foden was all over the pitch trying his best. But again, it was in areas that suited Arsenal a lot of the time. And then, of course, you got Carl Walker and even Guardiola, who got into a really great position at one point, you might remember in the game, where there was this big big space in behind the, the fullback. But, you know, because he's not an out and out fullback who's going to drive, he didn't want to there. And they were able to kind of get around it. And so to come back to the final element in terms of that cancelling out for this game, because I think it's an important thing to say, and it was fine margins. I don't think you can say that they deserved it. But again, if we show this line in here, you know, Zinchenko, as we've spoken about, coming in here, Gvardiol not wanting to go out wide, Carl Walker, he's only going to get to about here and you can cover him pretty easy. There was never any uh, desire really to get into these areas of the pitch from Man City. And I think what that led to was the ability for Arsenal to defend pretty narrow, was Ben White. And for the bulk of the game, you could defend like that. And then it's, you know, it's just so difficult to, you know, to do anything really because you should be able to. Um, resolve the issue nine times out of ten because it was so so congested let's get to the goal let's get to the ability for Arsenal to find a way here because I think you can ham it up and I don't want to do that too much because that's not what this channel is about it's about telling the truth and you know when we look at the statistics I felt felt like the inability to switch the play from um, Man City was another problem and the loss of Rodri is a big part of that if we have a look at the passes here you can see it Accurate passes. Someone like Bernardo Silva was fantastic. You know, 95% of his passes, 63 of 66 passes were accurate. But if we look at what Rodri brings a lot of the time, it's that ability to switch the play. And I think the culmination of not playing someone like Doku and being brave and having that width, probably due to the fact that they just wanted to control the game and they wanted to get out of there with, at the very least, a clean sheet, which they were, you know, five minutes away from doing. It meant that you didn't have that width. And if you haven't got that width, you can't really play those long balls. And if we have a look at the players that played those long balls, normally you would see someone like Rodri spraying passes from side to side. The goalkeepers, of course, did that from, you know, their starting positions in goal. But someone like Bernardo Silva, you know, three out of three, but someone like... Um, someone like Rodri in a game like this would definitely be doing that so much more. They'd be utilising the pitch. But there was that sort of cagey fear 
because key personnel were missing in this game. Let's show you the goal because a crucial thing here is kind of using what you've got to your advantage. And generally the thing that's you know so difficult when it comes to Man City is Vardiol, enormous. Ake, enormous. Diaz, enormous. Carl Walker, strong, solid, right? John Stone's getting brought on. And if we go to this genius moment where they found a way, the important thing here is that with all this size, how do you make a change? How do you win the game? How do you affect the game? And probably importantly, how do you win a duel that could lead to that? Because it did feel like an utter stalemate. Now, one thing I will say is I thought Martinelli came on at straight away. The guy's an absolute live wire. But this is so smart. Now, here's the first screenshot. Thomas Partey comes on. Thomas Partey is obviously on the ball here. What I want to focus on is this. Tommy Yasu. So Tommy Yasu has... Let's zoom out because it's getting a bit crazy now. Tommy Yasu has a little look, right? At Foden. And this is the clear directive. You know, substitute, substitute, substitute. Carl ha Kai Havertz coming on. And generally, it was a lot short passing. And even Declan Rice knows what's happening here. Really, really smart stuff. Because if Tommy Yasu... First of all, if Zinchenko's in this position where Tommy Yasu is, he doesn't make the run that he's about to make. Uh, but that's a clear, clear thing that's been said from Arteta to Tomiyasu, that what I want you to do is attach yourself to Phil Foden. And he had a look. He has this look, but then make that run. And it's so clever. And it's a, it's a different way of getting through and getting yourself a goal. Because if we move it forward, he then is able to get that yard up against Foden because Foden ultimately thinks Tommy Yasu is not really a threat here. You know, he's a left back who's just gone in to be inverted. And I've been playing Zinchenko the whole game, who's generally been staying in this area of the pitch. So there's nothing to worry about. Clever, clever stuff that he's probably said to Arteta and Thomas Partey because Thomas Partey is waiting for it. Declan Rice is declaring it. And if we move it on one more, am I going the right way now? There you go. So this is the header that leads to the ball dropping down to Kai Havertz. And importantly, I'll draw an arrow because you might struggle to see it. Martinelli is down here. OK, and what that means is just so smart, because if Tommy Asu or Nketiah, as it had been previously, or I thought was really ineffective, is up and is pinning that centre back, as you saw time and time again, the centre back wins it because they're all six foot plus and that's what they do. They win their headers. But by Tommy Yasu making that run, it means that Carl Walker is being he can't get there in time because he's concentrating on Martinelli. And so he's generally got to be about halfway when he makes his run. And then, of course, makes that little dart to try and get there. But it's too late. Tommy Yasu is in the middle of all of them. Diaz as well can't get there because he's focusing on Kai Havertz, who's with Ake and Foden, as we've spoken about, is too late. That means he has a free header in an incredibly dangerous area in a game where it's been so congested throughout. And Arteta saw that. Arteta saw that, OK, let's suck in the position, uh, the opposition. Let's understand that they're going to gently make their way to try and press us a little bit and let's hurt them. And ab absolutely every single player there is not concerned about a ball in behind. Maybe the only one is Diaz, who's thinking that Havertz might make that run. But he knows Kai Havertz isn't that kind of player. So these are the little things. Did Arsenal over the, you know, whole of the game did they deserve to win no but when it becomes about the details it becomes about the managers and it becomes about those substitutions and how you can affect the game and this goal if you go back and watch it in slow motion as I've just shown you you see that look from Tommy Yasu he's on the right side for him to get away from Foden and it leads to the goal there's no other way at looking at it and Martinelli, obviously, starting with that position as, that was well. It's utter genius. They found a way. And that's what it's about this year. And I think overall, what's great as well in a game like this, it was a great opportunity for Arsenal to win it, to make this league charge a reality. But I think, again, there's been so much conversation about the emotional side of it when it comes to Arsenal. Look, these are moments where, you know, by hook or by crook, or more importantly, by detail, can you find a way to make the difference? And that is all on Arteta today. Because is T Tommy Asu a world beater? No. Is Kai Havertz in current form a world beater? No. Martinelli's just coming back. You haven't got Saka on the pitch as well. Partey, you would like to start, I would imagine. Doesn't. You play someone like Jorginho. 
really, really smart way of finding a way in the detail to get yourself a victory. Arteta should be very, very happy with his work today or his coaching staff. You know what I mean. But we have ourselves possibly a bit of a title race now because that lack of width. And I think importantly, last thing to, to finish on is the inability for Haaland to get the service that he wants, I think is really hurting actually Man City right now because... The, the lack of Kevin De Bruyne, which hasn't been discussed, I thought there were so many moments where someone like Rico Lewis, if you swap him out, it, when it is Rico Lewis and Alvarez as well, you've got another player there. There's just no width, right? And so say you take Alvarez out like last season, you put Silver out on the right-hand side. Let's put Lewis there just for a second. The amount of crosses that we saw last year from this man into this area and Haaland peeled off and he was a cheat code. And at the moment, we are not seeing that at all. And look, you can have as many fancy tactic boards and you can talk about these different things. But sometimes you just need players to get you out of trouble. There's a mix. Sometimes the detail will help you. Sometimes you'll be able to find your strengths that will hurt the opposition or little clever things. But sometimes you need great players to get you out of trouble. And that is what Kevin De Bruyne has done for Man City time and time again. And I've got to be honest, as much as they're hurting without Rodri, I think they're really hurting without Kevin De Bruyne right now. Because how many times did we see this goal last year? And of course, we haven't seen it. Now you've got Haaland dealing with sort of scraps, really. He's having to, you know, the, the nice moments that we saw from him today... It was hold up play or it was a flick on at one point in the first half of the game. That's all we're getting. We're not really getting this back post goals, that sort of monster behavior from him because he's playing in a pretty congested zone right now. So awkward times for Man City. They're not going anywhere. They'll be there right at the end of it. But Arsenal might be there as well. And maybe Tottenham as well. You know, they're at the moment. I mean, could they? Probably not. But time will tell. If you enjoyed this video, if you got something out of it, do me a favor. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. And let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.